Okay. And can you put that one over there so that it can be seen right in front of Miss Jackson Lee? Is that okay with you? I thank the speaker and I thank the House for being in order because this is about our veterans. I have but one minute, so please allow me to speak on behalf of veterans for one minute. This is a moment of truth for us. Our veterans have been there for us. We had the courage of our convictions to send them to war. They've done their jobs, but many of them are returning home to properties that are being foreclosed upon that are, will be abated. This is an opportunity for us to spend 0.859% of the $1.6 trillion that we spent in Iraq and Afghanistan to help our veterans retain their homes. They have been there for us. The question is, will we be there for them today? I yield back the balance of my time, but don't you take up time to make sure that the veterans don't get what they deserve. Veterans have worked hard for us. We sent them to war. Let's now make sure that the gentleman is yielded his peace. time back. Let's take care of our veterans. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak in opposition to the motion to recommit. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, the House is not in order. The gentleman is correct. Gentlemen may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield to the distinguished chairman of the Financial Services Committee. I thank the speaker and I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're talking about our soldiers, our veterans. What do they do? They fight for our freedom, for our national defense. And what is the greatest threat to our country now? What is the greatest threat to our national security? It is the debt. Don't take my word for it. Admiral Mullen said just two months ago, the most significant threat to our national security is our debt. Defense Secretary Robert Gates said on CNN recently, the country's dire physical situation and the threat it poses to American influence and credibility around the world will only get worse unless the United States government faces its financial uh, Mr. Financial Speaker, the House crisis. is not in order. House will be you know, in order. And we can start representing continue. we can start representing our soldiers and our veterans and those they defend by cutting out this worthless billion dollar program where ninety eight cents out of every dollar is never repaid. Let's move today. Let's defend our country. Let's start cutting our debt. Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, the distinguished chairman of the Financial Services Committee brought to our attention something that I believe every veteran now knows, and that is the biggest threat to our national security is our national debt. Now, Mr. Speaker, I am not a veteran. My brother was, he fought during the Cold War. My father was, he fought during Korea. My grandfather was, he fought during World War II. So I know veterans, Mr. Speaker, and there are no citizens in our country that are more passionate about the preservation of our national security than our veterans. There is no veteran that I know of that would not put country before self. There is no veteran I know of that wants to mortgage our nation's future to China. There is no veteran I know of who wouldn't be ashamed and embarrassed to have China foreclose on our nation because of the national debt that has been run up by our friends on this side of the aisle. If we want to have a secure nation, if we want jobs, if we want to save America for our children from bankruptcy, we've got to quit spending money we don't have. Veterans put country before self. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, at this time, I yield to the distinguished chairman of the Veteran Affairs Committee. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Members, what we're talking about is 
trying to eliminate a program that is duplicative, a program that has been wasteful over the last few years. I think the colleagues that are speaking against what we are trying to do don't quite understand how the VA home loan program works. They have their own program that they can go to and borrow money. They're not being disadvantaged by doing away with the program that we are talking about today. In fact, if a VA individual has a loan that is guaranteed by VA and their home is underwater, they can go back to VA and get, in some instances, get that loan refinanced without an appraisal, including all the fees, including all the closing costs, and remind you again, even if the house is worth less than what the original loan was all about. Mr. Look, Speaker, the house is not in order. The gentleman is correct. We heard great large increases of numbers of foreclosures just a moment ago. Let me tell you what the number is in regards to foreclosures with VA loans. The foreclosure rate is 2.5 percent. Why? Because the VA works with the people who has these loans to make sure that they don't get into a serious delinquency more than 90 days in arrears so that they can stay in their home and if something happens that they have a problem VA has a program to take care of that too but here we have our colleagues on the other side of the aisle in some instances some of my colleagues may not have heard this questioning what we do in church on Sunday because we're not committed as the Lord requires us to do to other people that's not right. Both sides of the aisle are committed to what we think is right, and what we think is right is not mortgaging our country on the backs of our children and our grandchildren it's time to anymore. Expired. Without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question is on the motion to recommit. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. The no's have it. Uh, Mr. The gentleman Speaker. From, from, from Virginia is recognized. On that matter, I ask for the yeas and nays. Gentlemen, ask for a recorded vote. Recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic vote on the, quest on the question of passage. This will be a 15-minute vote. Votes now on a procedural motion attempting to send this bill back to committee. Again, the bill eliminating the Housing and Urban Development Department's mortgage help for the unemployed. Fifteen minutes on this vote, and we are expecting a final passage vote after this. That would wrap up legislative business in the House for the week. While the vote is underway, we've got remarks now from the U.N. where Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the Special Envoy to Libya are answering uh, reporters' questions on the situation in Libya after meeting with foreign heads of state earlier today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see you. I'm very pleased to be here with you, uh, joined by Mr. Abdelila Al-Hatib, my new special envoy to uh, Libya. As you know, uh, uh, he has served twice as foreign minister of Jordan, and he's now uh, serving as a senator of Jordan. We have just concluded a very detailed discussions concerning the full dimensions of the crisis in Libya and the role he will play. As the former foreign minister of Jordan, he brings to the job a seasoned understanding of the dynamics of the region and the wealth of experience. Uh, this is a critical and demanding assignment and I am grateful to him for taking it on. Our most immediate uh, challenge is a humanitarian. With each day, the death toll mounts and the situation of the Libyan people grows more desperate. Uh, we have all seen how the fighting has escalated. Civilians have borne the brunt of the violence. Increasingly, they are being targeted. My message has been strong and consistent. The violence must stop. Humanitarian aid must get to
to those in need, those responsible for violence against the civilians will be held accountable. A peaceful resolution must be found. That is why I have decided to dispatch Mr. Al Khatib to Libya uh, soon. He will depart from New York over the weekend, joined by a team that includes senior humanitarian officials as well as a staff from the Department of Political Affairs and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And they are expected to arrive in Tripoli uh, very soon, early next week. Uh, the objective will be to assess the situation on the ground and undertake broad consultations with the Libyan authorities on the immediate humanitarian, political, and security situation. I have instructed Mr. Al Khatib to convey in no uncertain terms the concerns of the United Nations and the international community as expressed in Security Council resolutions. Mr. Khatib will re report back to me as he continues his work. He will need to consult broadly with the Libyan authorities and other part parties as well as with the neighboring states and regional organizations on how best to resolve the crisis. Uh, yesterday, I met with the members of the Security Council who informed me that they are continuing to engage fully on the issues, both to ensure the implementation of the Security Council Resolution 1970, as well as to consider uh, next steps. Uh, for my part, I have been consulting very widely with world leaders, uh, focusing chiefly on Libya, but also the wider challenges in the region. In every conversation, at every opportunity, I have urged leaders to listen uh, to the voices of their people, to heed their aspirations for change, and to advance toward a better future uh, through dialogue and fully inclusive uh, democracy. I will be in the region myself later next week, when I intend to visit Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, just before that, I will also confer with the Central American leaders in Guatemala. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Al Hatib. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I want first to thank the Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki moon, for his trust and confidence in me in choosing me for this delicate and crucial mission. I accepted the Secretary General's offer with the hope that I will contribute positively to the UN efforts to help Libya and its people overcome the current crisis. I understand the complex nature of this task and the gravity of the situation on the ground, and I start my mission hoping that this effort that I undertake on behalf of the international community will succeed in stopping the killings and ending the suffering of the civilian population, in addressing their humanitarian needs and in preserving the unity of the Libyan people and the territorial integrity of their homeland. Achieving these goals is essential for enabling the Libyan people to choose their future and determine their destiny. I look forward to co conducting this mission in full cooperation with the Secretary General and with the relevant UN agencies under his leadership, as well as with member states. I will commence as soon as possible my contacts and consultations with the Arab and African group and with other member states in order to coordinate the international effort in assisting the Libyan people. And I look forward to a teamwork and to full support by the Secretary General and his team. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Would you call the Secretary General? Just in a Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, first of all, how long will your team headed by uh, the foreign minister will stay in Libya and are you assured of the freedom of their movement while they're there um, and my question to you sir will be in Arabic تحدثت عن مساعدة أهل ليبيا أهالي ليبيا لتخطي هذه الأزمة ومساعدة شعب ليبيا في تقرير مصيره كيف ستفعل ذلك من ناحية السياسية وأيضا ما هي رسالتك إلى وزراء الجامعة العربية المجتمعين غدا السبت في القاهرة للنظر في فرض الحرب الجوي طبعا هذه بداية مهمتي وأنا أتطلع للاتصال أولا للإطلاع على الوضع عن كثب ما أعرفه عن هذه الأزمة وعن الأوضاع على الأرض مجمل ومن الإعلام لذلك ذهابي هناك 
له قيمة في أن أطلع على الأوضاع ويجب أن يكون هناك انفتاح على كل الأطراف ورسالتي إلى الزملاء المجموعة العربية المجتمعين في القاهرة غدا أنني أتوقع أن أقوم بهذه المهمة بالتعاون الكامل مع المجموعة العربية أنا لسه يعني يجب أن أطلع على الأوضاع وأطلع على كل تفاصيل الأوضاع قبل أن أبحث في هذا الأمر. Wednesday morning, uh, I had a telephone talk with uh, Foreign Minister Kusa of Libya, and we discussed uh, uh, about my intention of uh, dispatching Mr. Al Hatib. Uh, Libyan government uh, welcomed uh, his visit. Uh, his visit uh, for the exact duration of his stay, we'll have to see. I'm not quite sure, but I expect that he will be there for uh, several days uh, in meeting with uh, uh, government officials and other necessary uh, uh, people. Uh, that is not yet sure. Uh, then he will uh, come back and brief me in the region uh, while I'll be traveling. Uh, in e Tunisia and Egypt. Then we will discuss uh, further steps of his work. Uh, yeah, you said that the main purpose at the moment is humanitarian for Mr. Khatib, but to what degree do you see this also as a political role as taking a central position in terms of trying to mediate any kind of political solution like a ceasefire or whatever? If I could get a response from both of you, please. He's uh, a special envoy of the Secretary General to uh, Libya. Uh, at this time, we expect that uh, we need to take uh, urgent action uh, to stop all this uh, violence. Uh, and this has uh, very serious humanitarian uh, implications. Uh, so he will focus on uh, putting an end to this uh, violence, but I, I expect that uh, he will be engaged in a broader dimension of this crisis. Uh, including uh, political issues. Will Mr. Khatib meet with the opposition government while he's there? Well, uh, I'll uh, try to learn as much as possible uh, about the details of the situation on the ground, and I'm uh, prepared to meet all parties concerned, and I think uh, that is essential in order to uh, know uh, the positions and the views of all parties. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Would you call for a ceasefire cease to allow uh, humanitarian aid for the civilians in many parts of, the, of Libya? And have you had any contact with uh, the Provisional uh, Council in, in Benghazi? Thank you. My message has been consistent and clear uh, that violence must stop and let the humanitarian uh, workers uh, do their work to help uh, those people in need. Uh, we will uh, see uh, what kind of a course of action uh, we will take uh, after uh, his visit to Libya. Have, have you contacted the uh, provisional council? No, I have not. Uh, yeah. But as a follow-up, do you consider the council uh, as a legitimate uh, uh, representative for the Libyan people? The recognition of uh, this council or any government is the matter to be determined by the member states of the United Nations. Okay, the last question. Secretary General, um, there is a lot of talk by prominent U.S. senators and from other countries too about sending weapons to the rebels in Libya. Are you warning these countries that that will violate uh, Resolution 1970 and in such case what would the U.N. do? Again, uh, I understand that the international community, international organizations, including UN Security Council, uh, they uh, are discussing broad range of uh, options uh, for uh, uh, next steps. But this is uh, uh, up to the member states of the Security Council uh, to determine future course of action. UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon earlier today joined by the UN Special Envoy to Libya on the situation in that country. Secretary of State Clinton will be traveling to the region next week. She announced yesterday she'll 
She's uh, set up talks with Egyptian and Tunisian leaders after weeks of political unrest and uncertainty over uh, what governor, government will be established in those countries. The Secretary General did not address the tragedy in Japan this morning after the earthquake there. And according to the Associated Press, hundreds are dead. More than 500 others are missing after a tsunami slammed the eastern coast of Japan, sweeping away boats, cars, and homes. It was unleashed by one of the biggest earthquakes ever recorded, nearly 8,000 times stronger than the one that struck New Zealand late last month. Fires are also burning out of control. And waves are surging slightly along California's northern coast from that tsunami from Japan. First waves have reached the Oregon coast. They reached them uh, early this morning. Coastal officials from California to Washington State have been closing beaches and advising people to move to higher ground. Right now, votes on a procedural motion attempting to send the bill back to committee. This will would eliminate the Housing and Urban Development Department's mortgage help for the unemployed. Fifteen minutes on this vote, just a couple of minutes remaining, and we expect a final passage vote after this. The A's are 182, the nays are 238. The motion is not adopted. The question is on passage of the bill. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. The, A's ha the ayes have it. For what purpose is the gentleman from On that, I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. Those favoring a recorded vote will rise. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. So a vote now on final passage of a housing and urban development bill eliminating a mortgage relief program that would help unemployed homeowners who are in danger of losing their homes. It provides a billion dollars for homeowners in the form of loans, credit advances, and payments to help with their mortgage while they're unemployed. This will be the last bit of legislative business for the House for the week.
Vote. The yeas are 242. The nays are 177. The bill is passed. Oh, without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. But for what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent in the engrossment of H.R. 830. The clerk be authorized to correct section numbers, punctuation, and cross-references and to make such other technical and conforming changes as may be necessary to accurately reflect the actions of the House. Without objection. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute for the purpose of making an announcement to our colleagues. Without objection. So Speaker, ordered. the Committee on Rules is scheduled to meet on Tuesday, March 15th at 3 p.m. to grant a rule which may limit the amendment process for full consideration of H.R. 839, the HAMP Termination Act of 2011, and H.R. 861, the NSP Termination Act. Any member wishing to offer an amendment to either bill must submit an electronic copy of the amendment and description via the committee's website. Members must also submit 30 hard copies of the amendment one copy of a brief explanation of the amendment, and an amendment log in form uh, to uh, the Rules Committee in room H312 upstairs of the Capitol by 10 a.m. Tuesday, March 15th. Both electronic and hard copies must be received by the date and time specified. Members should draft their amendments to the text of the bills as ordered reported by the Committee on Financial Services, which are available on the Rules Committee website. Members should use the Office of Legislative Counsel to ensure that their amendments are drafted in the most appropriate format. Members should also check with the Office of the Parliamentarian, the Committee on the Budget, and the Congressional Budget Office to be certain that their amendments comply with the rules of the House and the Congressional Budget Act. If members have any questions, please contact me or the Rules Committee staff. And uh, I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker, and hope you have a very nice weekend. The gentleman's announcement will appear in the record. This will be in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for one minute for the purposes of inquiring of the majority leader the schedule for the week to come. Without objection, so ordered. I thank the uh, speaker and I yield to my friend, the majority leader, Mr. Cantor. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Maryland, the Democratic Whip, for yielding. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the House will meet at noon for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business. On Tuesday and Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and noon for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. The House will consider at least two bills under suspension of the rules on Monday, which will be announced by the close of business today. On Tuesday, we expect to consider a short-term continuing resolution to fund the government for another three weeks. <clears throat> On Wednesday, the House will consider one or possibly two more bills from the Financial Services Committee addressing mandatory spending. H.R. 839, the Home Affordable Modification Program Termination Act, and H.R. 861, the Neighborhood Stabilization Program Termination Act. Mr. Speaker, Act. the House is not in order. The House will please be in order. The gentleman may continue. Finally, Mr. Speaker, on Thursday, the House will consider a concurrent resolution <coughs> sponsored by Mr. Kucinich relating to the War Powers Resolution, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman for that information, uh, and uh, he mentioned the CR, the Continuing Resolution, the Continuing Authorization to uh, Operate Government, uh, which uh, I understand will be for a three-week uh, period. Uh, can the gentleman uh, tell us uh, what will be in that uh, continuing resolution at this point in time? I yield to my friend. Right. The, uh, uh, as the, the gentleman knows um, uh, that uh, our majority is committed to uh, the process of providing a three-day notice for all members as well as their constituents to see what we'll be voting on. The Appropriations Committee, committee is busy uh, preparing uh, the text of that and will be um, presented online this afternoon uh, and uh, the details will be in that uh, online uh, version this afternoon. I yield back. Thank the gentleman for his comments. Now, it's, it's my understanding we are not scheduled, uh, according to his announcement, uh, to meet next Friday. Is that accurate? 
Uh, yes, I would say to the gentleman that is correct. And I take it the uh, gentleman is reasonably certain. Uh, obviously, we don't know what the other body will do, but uh, uh, in light of the fact that that uh, CR will be offered uh, next Tuesday, uh, the gentleman's presumption is that, in fact, we will be out uh, someday, sometime on Thursday. Well, we certainly, I would say to the gentleman, we certainly look forward to uh, the Senate acting expeditiously and acting quickly on the House's three-week extension. Uh, assuming that goes as well, the gentleman is correct in assuming that we will not be in session next Friday. You'll back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I think the, the gentleman and I have had this discussion, and I think we both agree that uh, uh, continuing to fund government on either a two-week or three-week cycle is, is not uh, what we ought to be doing. Uh, furthermore, uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, number of economists have indicated that if, in fact, we proceed uh, to funding levels that reflect H.R. 1, which is my assumption of what will happen uh, according to what the gentleman has told me and I think said publicly, uh, the funding levels that are included in H.R. 1 on a week-to-week -week basis, uh, which leads me to believe that if we're having a three-week extension, we'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of six billion dollars in additional uh, reductions. Would that be accurate? Uh, and I'll I, yield to my friend. I would agree with the gentleman that yes, as he and I have discussed, um, we intend uh, for the three-week extension uh, to maintain the current formula upon which we are operating today, and that is a reduction of spending of $2 billion per week. And uh, I expect the Appropriations Committee, again, to introduce a three-week short-term extension, cutting $2 billion per week later this afternoon, consistent with the House position uh, as uh, spelled out in H.R. 1. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his comments, and I would observe to him that uh, with respect to H.R. 1, Numerous economists uh, have indicated, including Mark Zandi, who is, of course, one of the principal advisors to uh, John McCain when he ran for president, uh, Chairman Bernanke, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Goldman Sachs, uh, Moody's, uh, and others, uh, that the just-rejected H.R. 1, uh, if adopted, would lead to the loss of hundreds of thousands of uh, jobs. Uh, in one analysis uh, point of view, uh, over 800,000 jobs. In fact, uh, of course, three Republicans voted against H.R. 1 in the Senate, uh, and one of those who voted for uh, H.R. 1 in the Senate said this, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear that I strongly oppose some of the proposed cuts in the House passed bill. That was H.R. 1, particularly the drastic cuts that would disproportionately affect low-income families and seniors. Making such deep and immediate cuts to critical low-income heating assistance, weatherization, and Head Start programs in the middle of the fiscal year uh, would cause serious problems for those who rely on these programs. That was Senator Collins, Republican of Maine, uh, when the bill was on the floor. So let me ask the gentleman, uh, do we have a, a plan uh, to proceed so that we can, A, uh, retreat from the uncertainty that we keep creating by these two weeks? And I know he and I agree that this is not the way to proceed, but does the gentleman have a plan, uh, A, to move forward so that we can fund government through September 30th, uh, complete the funding for this fiscal year, and turn our attention and focus on what I know the gentleman knows Appropriations Committee is now focusing on, uh, the fiscal year 12 uh, appropriations uh, and uh, spending plan. Uh, does the gentleman uh, have in mind uh, when we might get to a plan to fund the balance of government, not on two or three week cycles, but between now and September 30th? And I yield to my friend. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to speak to the uh, first part of the gentleman's discussion regarding uh, Mr. Zandi and other individuals he spoke to regarding the predictions of doom uh, because of our position on H.R. 1. And I would say to the gentleman, as he knows, there are as many economists, certainly several hundred, who signed a letter indicating that the cuts uh, were not something uh, that uh, would produce the results that Mr. Zandi and others have predicted. 
and in fact, it's Mr. Zandi's math uh, that was applicable to the stimulus bill that I think most Americans do know now failed in the promises made that we would see unemployment not rise above 8 percent. And again, the gentleman and I have had the discussion before that if the answer was just spend more government taxpayer dollars to create jobs, why don't we just go spend it all and then everybody will be employed again? Well, we know that's not true and that doesn't work. Uh, and so we also know that Chairman Bernanke did not say, did not agree with uh, the, the predictions of the kind of cuts that Mr. Zandi and others uh, have, uh, have predicted according uh, to, uh, to his testimony and certainly uh, we believe very strongly uh, that if you cut government spending, we create an environment for private sector jobs. And as to the gentleman's direct question about when we can foresee a longer term solution so we do not have to continue operating in stopgap ways, I would say to the gentleman, as he knows, it's not just the House. It's trying to work with the Senate as well as the White House. The Senate did act uh, this week, and we now know that the Senate rejects uh, our 60 uh, billion, approximately $60 billion cut off of 010 levels, and it also rejected uh, the uh, proposed $10 billion worth of cuts by Leader Reid. In fact, there were more votes in favor of the $60 billion HR1 level than there were off the $10 billion level off of current spending. Uh, the problem is the White House has not indicated where it wants to go. And as we both have discussed before, uh, as I have told the gentleman, um, I just don't see where the leadership is on the part of the White House. Um, it is obviously up to the White House to come to the table as well as the President's got to sign the bill. Uh, we agree it is much better for us to be operating with some certainty and not have to be operating off of stopgap measures every several weeks. But we don't want to shut the government down. We want to cut spending. And if this is how we're able to do it, we're going to deliver on that promise to cut spending. But I do share with the gentleman the frustration that we don't see any type of coalescence around um, a notion that we should have some type of longer term uh, agreement on this fiscal year. And I yield back. I thank the uh, gentleman uh, for his uh, response, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, uh, I understand the gentleman's issue with re respect to the President. Uh, both the gentleman and I uh, understand and agree uh, that the Constitution uh, in Article I gives to the House of Representatives of the United States Senate the responsibility to uh, raise and uh, spend monies. Uh, so that this is a primary responsibility of the legislative department of government, which he and I have the uh, privilege of serving in. Uh, so uh, while I understand that the gentleman's accurate, both alternatives were defeated in the United States Senate. Uh, the president put an offer on the table um, in his 2011 budget. Uh, we then, in December, uh, froze spending at 2010 levels, which was $41 billion less than the President's offer, which he put on the table. Uh, we have now had a, two additional offers put on the table. The next offer was, of course, included in H.R. 1. That passed this House, but did not pass the Senate. Uh, the Senate, however, did put an offer on the table, as the gentleman pointed out, cutting an additional uh, $10 billion above the $41 billion or $6 billion above the $4 billion that was included in the short-term uh, CR, which expires on March 18th. Uh, what I ask the gentleman again is, uh, does the gentleman uh, now uh, uh, propose, and, and will the gentleman and his side of the aisle be proposing a, a counter-offer, uh, as I said last week, or is the gentleman's position you are staying, as I seem to hear you say, at the $100 billion a figure that was included in H.R. 1, which implies that unless there is an agreement to your figure, that we will have to shut down government or agree to your figure. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure that I understand uh, your thoughts on that, and I yield to my friend. I, I say to the gentleman again, is the House has taken the position that we want to see cuts of 60, approximately $60 billion off of current 2010 levels. Uh, the Senate um, said it wanted to cut two, uh, $10 billion off of 2010 levels. There's a $50 billion difference here. What we believe is 
we need to do everything we can to figure out how to do more with less in Washington. The American public uh, sent us to Washington to spend their money the way they would. I think most people also, certainly our conference believes, you cut government spending, you create private sector jobs. That's what we're about. We're waiting to see uh, what, um, what position uh, the White House will take so that we can move forward and begin the job that we're supposed to be about right now, uh, which is the next fiscal year. As the gentleman knows, we are here because, unfortunately, last Congress did not pass a budget, did not pass appropriations bills. We're trying to clean up that mess. So we're waiting to see what the White House's position is so we can begin to see how we can maximize efficiencies in government, cut spending so that we can see more private sector jobs. Now you're back. Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman for his answer, and uh, I, th I think I did not receive an answer in terms of whether or not uh, the gentleman is saying we're, it's either $100 billion or nothing, and that there will be no counter offer to the offer that is on the table, uh, either from the President or, uh, more accurately at this point in time, in terms of uh, the timing uh, from the Senate, uh, which got us to $51 billion in cut, which although the gentleman would like to say uh, it's between zero and 60, the gentleman in his, in his pledge to America said he was going to cut $100 billion. The reason he got to $100 billion was he counted the $41 billion uh, cut from the President's initial offer of 2011 uh, spending. What has happened since the gentleman and his party made that offer, Mr. Speaker, is that in fact 41 billion of that hundred was uh, accepted in the CR that was passed, uh, which expired uh, two weeks ago. Uh, since that time, we've put, uh, from the Senate's perspective, an additional uh, 10 billion dollars on the table to get us to 51 billion. The way I calculate it, that is more than halfway from the gentleman's offer, not of 60 billion in his pledge to America, but 100 billion. And the way he got to 100 billion is the $41 billion that we already cut in the first CR. The additional $10 billion is now $51 billion. I say to the gentleman, we've come halfway, a little more than halfway. And we are now asking the gentleman, uh, is, is he going to have a counter offer for us that we can consider from our offer of $51 billion, which we believe is more than halfway? I will tell you further, Mr. Uh, Leader, uh, that uh, it is my staff's belief uh, and I could be corrected on this, that the offer that is on the table represents the single largest cut from one year to the next uh, uh, since I've been in the Congress of the United States, uh, which is largely under Republican presidents. So uh, I would uh, uh, ask my friend, we obviously uh, are prepared to agree and have agreed uh, on uh, very substantial restraints. Uh, in spending, cutting spending, trying to get a handle on this deficit. Uh, as you know, I'm concerned about the fact that in the rule we adopted on the first day of the session that you provided for $4.7 trillion in additional uh, tax expenditures, if you will, tax cuts, uh, cutting of revenue that is projected currently by CBO, which will lead to $4.7 trillion of additional spending while you have proposed a trillion dollars of cuts, leaving a net appreciation of the deficit of $3.7 trillion, increased deficit that is, in fact, planned for under your rule. All I'm asking for now is, do you have and will you have a counteroffer to our $51 billion uh, uh, offer uh, so that we can then try to move on and reach compromise? If it is simply no, we want $100 billion or nothing, then we'll have to make a decision, as I've told the gentleman on our side of the aisle, uh, what do we do at that point in time? Uh, we obviously have a, uh, the majority in the Senate. Uh, we have the President of the United States, the American people have uh, uh, elected, and as uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, your former speaker, our former speaker said in 1998, you know, we have to reach agreement. And the way you reach agreement is to get offers back and forth. We think we have an offer on the table, and we'd like to hear your counteroffer. Well, I first, yield to my friend. First of all, I'd tell the gentleman, first of all, the, the problem is that 
the $10 billion proposal off of current spending, that that is the largest cut that has ever been proposed <coughs> since the gentleman has been in Congress. That's the problem. That's well, the problem. Now, will the gentleman yield just no, to, I, I, no, I, I want to clarify. I'm reclaiming my time then. I did not say it was the largest cut that ever been proposed in Congress. I said the, it is the largest cut from one year to the other, right. uh, from previous year spending, uh, and it is 13.6 billion, I believe, 17 point, 17 billion, in, and, and I, the, my staffer, uh, who's brilliant, much more brilliant than I am, uh, reminds me that I am and talking. The gentleman has a lot of those. Right. <laughs> Both of us do. Yes. Uh, the, what, I, I want to clarify, so the public understands uh, as well when they hear us, is that what we're talking about cutting from is 14% of the budget, the discretionary, non-defense, non-security part of the budget. Uh, so let me focus on that. And when I speak of the uh, cut, and you say it's 17 point, 17 billion in non-security, that from year to year, since I've been here since 1981, is the largest single cut in non-defense, non-security, discretionary spending from one year to the other. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, and that's in a very small 14% slice of the budget. Frankly, the, the discussions we've had to date ignore the other 81 to 3 percent of the budget. Obviously, interest rates are, are, are not subject to uh, being reduced. We need to pay our debt. Uh, but, uh, so I just want to clarify, uh, A, that I'm speaking of the discretionary part of the budget, non-defense, non-security, and yes, from year to year, it is, in fact, uh, what's sitting on the table as an offer to you, the largest cut we've had in non-defense, non-security, discretionary spending in the last 30 years. I'd say the gentleman, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly the problem still. Uh, because as the gentleman alludes, uh, we have over a trillion and a half dollar deficit this year alone. And I understand the gentleman's point about there being just a smaller piece of the budget from which these cuts are being taken. But the bottom line is, that's the problem. We've got to work harder to cut more so that private sector jobs can be created. Now, I'd say to the gentleman two things. One, uh, I look forward to his support then of the budget that we bring forward because we are, as the gentleman knows, going to be dealing with how to reform the entitlement programs, which are the significant driver of deficits into the future, as he knows. So I do look forward to that. We will be dealing with that within a month's time uh, and look forward to that debate. But I would lastly say, Mr. Speaker, does the gentleman know what kind of cuts the Senate can support at the 60 vote level? Because I don't. So I don't see a counteroffer there. I don't see a position that the Senate or your side of the, uh, or the gentleman's side of the aisle has taken. I don't see the President having come down at a level that is acceptable at all because he hasn't come down to a level. Uh, so this is the problem, Mr. Speaker. We have made our position known. The House wants to cut 60-some billion dollars off of the 010 levels or 100 billion dollars off of the 011 proposals. Uh, we don't want the status quo. We want to continue to cut spending. We can't come to any agreement when the other side doesn't come forward with any offer, and that's why we've been forced into this situation where we are once again proposing a stopgap measure so that we can see the government operate so it doesn't shut down in the name of trying to do more with less. Now, you're back. I thank my friend for yielding. Let me make a point here, Mr. Speaker. As I understand it, the gentleman continues to take the position until we get to 100, there is no credible counteroffer. Uh, Two billion a week. Let me say that uh, uh, the gentleman served with a very conservative member, uh, also a, a, a great member of this Congress, a guy named Joe Scarborough. Most of America knows Joe Scarborough. Let me give a quote uh, from Joe Scarborough. There are elements of the GOP spending plan that cause me great concern. The belief of some on the right that America can balance the budget by cutting education, infrastructure, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and home eating ass assistance to the poor is tantamount to budgetary witchcraft. That's not a Republican. I mean, that's not a Democrat. That's Joe Scarborough, conservative member from northern Florida, with whom I served. 
Now a lot of people see him on Morning Joe every day. Uh, the fact of the matter is, that's what he said. Now we're looking for a counteroffer because we don't agree with some of H.R. 1, as you well know. As a matter of fact, every conservative Democrat, every liberal Democrat, and everybody in between voted no on H.R. 1, as did three of your Republicans over there, and Susan Collins, who voted for it, said she didn't like the elements in it. So what I'm saying to my friend very sincerely is he can preach all he wants about we need to cut spending. We agree with that. And the issue is where you cut it from. What impact does it have? Does it sustain the economy or does it deflate the economy? Does it create jobs or does it lose jobs? Does it help people who need help or does it abandon people who need help? That's the issue. And what I'm saying to my friend with all due respect is we have made an offer. Gentlemen, he wants to talk about the president. Article 1 of the Constitution says we need to do this. This is our responsibility. The people elected us to do it. And the people elected us to reach agreement. And how do you reach agreement? This is what I want. This is what you want. But if what you're saying, we have come up, we have moved pretty substantially. We think it was appropriate to move. Now we're asking you, are you prepared to move from the position you have taken consistently at your figure, which a lot of your folks think has problems in its constituent parts. I'm asking you, and I can't get an answer, and, and you apparently are not going to make a counteroffer as to, okay, we took 100, we passed it, couldn't pass the Senate, you offered something in return, and what I mean by you, the Senate didn't pass it. The gentleman is absolutely correct. But we Democrats have made the offer here and there of the $51 billion. President's indicated he could sign that. He said that publicly. Now, that's our offer sitting on the table. My, my suspicion is you've rejected that offer. Well, I, I would uh, say and if you have rejected my, my, my question, Listen, I yield to my friend. I thank the gentleman again, not to belabor the point, but I did say, Mr. Speaker, that there was not 60 votes in the Senate for the offer he speaks of. In fact, there were more votes for the $60 billion off of the current funding levels that is our plan. So there is really no offer on the table that is valid because it can't pass the Senate. What is the Democratic Senate's offer on the table? The gentleman rightfully says it is up to we, is, it is up to us in Congress, the people elect us, to, to, to try and come together and, and agree upon a spending plan. What, what's the offer? There is no offer that could pass in the Senate. We passed the House version. We know where the House stands. So I, I'm, I'm just having difficulty in understanding where the offer is. So again, Mr. Speaker, I think you know, the gentleman's made his points. Uh, he's frustrated because he sees there's no movement because the Senate's been unable to get an offer on the table uh, that can garner 60 votes. So the gentleman wants us to negotiate, you know, with ourselves. No, we want to cut spending, keep the government open. That's why we're in a position we are to do another stopgap measure uh, so that we can hopefully iron out some differences, cooperate in trying to keep the government open and cut spending so that people in the private sector get back to work. Now you yield back. I thank the gentleman for yielding. As I understand what the gentleman is saying, if the Senate get, can't get 60 votes, which of course we have seen the gridlock uh, for a long period of time where the Senate can't get 60 votes, uh, that we're not going to go anywhere uh, from the offer that he's made to pass something that can in fact garner 60 votes uh, in the Senate. Uh, I regret that the Senate, uh, uh, frankly, didn't uh, get 60 votes for uh, our offer. Uh, and he is uh, correct uh, that uh, uh, he got a few more votes for H.R. 1 uh, than uh, uh, was gotten for the Senate uh, uh, Majority Leader's uh, counteroffer. But the fact of the matter is, uh, this is really an issue between uh, the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, Senator McConnell has said, as I know the majority leader says, uh, we'll pass what the House passes. That's what he said. Uh, now, if that's the case, then we need to pass something uh, that can garner 60 votes over there. We know that H.R. 1 couldn't get 60 votes. We know that Senator Reid's proposal couldn't get 60 votes. And if we're going to move this government forward and not fund it on two-week cycles, and Senator McCain 
has said that funding Defense Department on two week or three week cycles is undermining our national security. So there is no uh, disagreement that doing things two weeks at a time does not make sense. And if the gentleman's view is simply you will not make some offer that we think and we can have a discussion about trying to come to agreement on that, uh, that we can get 60 votes for in the Senate and we're going to fund it on two week cycles. I say to my friend, that's going to be damaging to the economy, create great uncertainty and undermine our national security. And I would hope that the gentleman would, uh, would see fit to, to uh, uh, determine uh, where we can meet somewhere in the middle. We think we've come 51 percent of the way towards your 100. Towards your 100. You keep talking about 60. That was not your pledge. Your pledge was 100. And the way you got to 100 was count to 41. We've done that. We've done another 10. Uh, so we've come, we think, 51 percent of the way. You don't, you don't count it that way, and we understand that. But whatever way we come, we need to move on. You won the majority, God bless you. I'm sorry about that, but I live with it, and there it is. You have the majority. And with the majority, you have the responsibility to see if we can move this country forward. That's what Newt Gingrich said, uh, and, and can't be the perfectionist caucus, uh, as he referred to, of sticking just at a number that doesn't have the votes in the United States Senate. And if, well, if we're going to be on this two-week cycle, I will tell my friend, you may keep passing these two weeks uh, at a time. None of us want to shut down government. But I will tell you that uh, uh, while, I, uh, while I and my colleagues, some of my colleagues may vote uh, to do this one more time, uh, for me, it's the last time. We need to have a plan to fund this government for the balance of the fiscal year to September 30th. It is irresponsible for us not to have that and just each of us sticking to our uh, number and you sticking to your number and just pointing fingers at one another saying the Senate can't get 60 votes for anything we propose will not serve our country or our people. And uh, unless the gentleman wants to say something further, I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back.